Hello, and thanks for joining me today for another episode of the podcast. I'm Les Raymond. I'm your host today at The Mindful Movement, and I want to thank you for tuning in. We have a special guest today. His name is Dr. Perry Nicholson. He is a chiropractor. He works with lasers, which is really cool. Uh, At least it's cool sounding. It's pretty amazing that you can use a laser to interact with your biology and get a positive outcome. That's really exciting. And today's talk is a lot on the lymphatic system. Dr. Perry Nicholson works uh, a lot with this. I would say he's an expert on this system. And I would say it's, from what I understand, it's the least understood or like most overlooked, underestimated system in our body. We carry more lymphatic fluid than we do blood, yet nobody seems to pay too much attention to it. And we play a huge role in how we live in how we support that system. And we can support it through different ways, through breath or movement. And we're gonna touch on those topics today and hopefully find some value where we can learn some tips of how to incorporate lifestyle practices that help support this very important system that we all have. So I hope you enjoy. And if you do, then please do me a favor and go out to wherever you could uh, wherever you listen to this and you know put a review i really appreciate it i'm still new to this some of you have gone out and give me some feedback it's been really positive so i thank you for that Um, and i just encourage others to do that and i would really appreciate it so uh, with gratitude thank you for your listening and i hope you enjoy the show Okay, welcome to the Mindful Movement Podcast. I'm Les Raymond, your host. Thanks for joining me today. Today I have a special guest. He um, has quite a few titles. We're going to link to his his uh, bio in the show notes. But just to summarize, he is a chiropractor. He is the founder of Stop Chasing Pain. He is the founder of the Pain Laser Center and the founder of Functional Health Solutions. He's personally played a big role in my own healing journey and allowed me to explore kind of new practices that I find have really helped me along the way. And I'd like to introduce him to now, uh, like to introduce him now to you guys. His name is Dr. Perry Nicholson. Perry, you want to say hello? Hey, everybody. How are you? Thanks for having me on the show, my friend. I'm really excited to be here. So, a big part of our channel here is the idea of of really self-healing and empowering our audience to learn new tools and explore the role that they have in their own self-healing and things that they can, they could interact with to play really a, a bigger role in their own sense of well-being. And I feel like watching you over the years, you are a huge contributor to really encouraging the ideas of well-being to the world. And you play a big role, and I'm really grateful that I've stumbled across your work along the way. Maybe we could start out by explaining where the word stop chasing pain came from and what that means to lay some context for our audience. Sure, absolutely. But first, I'd like to pay you a compliment. I already like the words you've used so far, empowerment, which is very important to me, uh, which we'll touch on. And I love the name of the podcast, Movement. (laughs) We love movement, but mindful as well, which just means being more present with your movement. So big shout out to you before we begin. Um, Yeah, so the Stop Chasing Pain is an interesting journey from that one. Um, What I tell people this, it, it doesn't mean that we still don't treat pain right Uh, so if something hurts that's the body telling you i need you to change something so let's kind of go with what i believe the definition of pain is and to me pain is a request for change and a request from whom well your body right the the systems of your body it's basically kind of tapping you on the shoulder saying I, I need you to change something. I'm not quite sure what it is, but I know that whatever we're doing right now uh, ain't working out so good because that's why I'm sending you some pain. And, um, you know, that's been my journey of, okay, well, most of the time when people talk about pain is they just go chasing right after that side of pain where the uh, 
quote unquote injury might be, or they point here, let's say to the shoulder, and then that's where they think the problem is. And sometimes it might be that you'll find, especially with chronic pain, that very rarely is the site of pain the true underlying cause. It's coming and manifesting from somewhere else, but we get caught up in chasing that site of pain. And you have to keep in context the difference between chronic pain and traumatic acute pain. You know, if I fall on my shoulder, it's pretty straightforward of why that might hurt. I'm probably going to investigate why you fell in the first place, but it, you would land on your shoulder and then you treat the shoulder and then it should get better if all goes well. And that's great. But if the shoulder kind of all of a sudden, ah, you know, my shoulder's really killing me with my workouts. That's a slow progression. And uh, it's usually not just that one spot that you want to be on. And my, my whole journey up to this point when I was a chiropractor and going after the side of pain, I would just keep doing therapies to those locations. And I got very frustrated because everything just ended up coming back all the time no matter what I did. And uh, I've always wanted to find out why stuff does that. And then I began to look outside of just the site of pain into different parts of the body. And people say, well, where do you look? And my answer is yes, you have to look everywhere. And that depends on the individual that's standing in front of you. And where you need to go is first of all, knowing that big one that you should be looking somewhere else. But then where you go next depends on what the person says to you and their life history and then watching how they move and their big reveals come from the individual standing in front of you. And it can be overwhelming sometimes because one of the key phrases I use is that nothing is more terrifying than the idea of unlimited possibilities. And then that's what it can be when someone is standing in front of you with chronic pain. It can come from as many damn causes as the body wants it to be. It's, it's never just one, first of all. And many, many other different types of systems of the body, not just the one that you're physically having the, the pain or the symptoms of. And I'm sure we'll get into that later. And the name actually came from a workshop that I was at from my movement mentor, Gray Cook which I know you know, who was the founder of the Functional Movement Systems, Functional Movement Screen, who was the most influential person in, in my career in regards to looking at the body by far. And I was at a medical workshop that he was putting on, and three words showed up on this white slide projecting on the screen that said, stop chasing pain and it really just hit me like a ton of bricks saying that makes so much sense and what I haven't been doing and I immediately I tell everybody the joke is I stopped listening to the lecture at that point I went into my phone I did a google search with GoDaddy to see is that domain name hmm. taken yet I snagged the name and then I asked for permission later to use it. So that's like, you know, you do something and you ask for forgiveness later. Right. And Gray was like, yeah, you absolutely run with that thing. And that's what I've been doing ever since to try to show people that there's much more to it. And you don't have to lose hope and get frustrated if you're just going after where it hurts and it's not working. That, that yeah, I'm always amazed. To look. I've yeah. had a lot of, um, I guess, personal experience with like seeing different kind of uh, like manual therapists and chiropractors. And it seems like the most productive sessions are the ones where they don't seem to be working anywhere near the area that I feel like when I walked in, I had trouble and you know, the body's such a complex system and there's so many variables. And when you're in it and from your experience, it's, it's so it's really hard to kind of disassociate that the pain that you have isn't coming from where you feel it or yeah. the causal, you know, cumulative cause, the momentum leading to that pain, you know, it could come from anywhere, but from inside your body, it's hard to see that. And it could be really helpful to, you need other eyes, you know, you need a different perspective. 
And, uh, you know, you brought up the functional movement systems and I'll just insert this here. This is, I guess, where our eye was first introduced to you. And you mentioned Gray Cook and what an amazing mind in the movement world who's contributed so much to the movement field. And I remember the one thing that, that was like a big game changer for me as a personal trainer at the time where I went from, I guess, dispensing exercises to people to being an observer of movement and was awoken to the fact that there's a totally different approach to look at movement in general. And, um, and Gray Cook is responsible, at least partially, to put together this screen that allowed movement professionals to like quantify, for those that aren't familiar, to, to really quantify how well is somebody moving, a sign of value, and then incorporate exercises to change the way that they move, to move towards some desired direction. And that was really a, a profound thing. And even though I think since then, I've personally have taken a lot from that, but have moved on a little bit and continue to evolve the way I practice and the way I dish out my practice. But that was such a powerful paradigm shift, stopping and becoming an observer of movement. And that was probably just such an influential thing to the, to the industry of movement as a whole. Um, and, and then for some reason, I guess you disappeared off my radar for a little while. And I was really fortunate that recently, um, you know, I'm always looking for some some new tool to help me in my own practice and you have this amazing resource i mean the website is really an amazing resource and i was going through your blog post actually and something came to mind uh, something that i i just love from uh, i guess he's a buddhist teacher maybe one of the most influential teachers of the last gener like century Thich Nhat han and he says yeah. Uh, under, knowledge is the biggest obstacle to understanding. And there was something clear that I saw going through your work and your history of blog posts that there is clearly never a point where you sense that your approach is, I got this, like I figured this out, like I know what I'm doing. It was a just kind of a relentless, continuous curiosity uh, that is shown in the progression of your work. And I was going back to some pretty old posts and, <laughs> and it shows yeah. and it's very inviting. And you also have this resource of these courses. And this is what I was really lucky enough to stumble upon um, because I was in my own journey. I had that our audience has heard a little bit about of dealing with Lyme and some chronic illness. I felt like I hit like a roadblock with this lymphatic system. And I felt really uneducated about it, but I had this gut feeling that it, it was really important. And then uh, along like my Facebook feed, I see an advertisement for your course. And you know, it's funny because people will complain about how Facebook and the algorithm seem to know what you're thinking or they're following you. And I love that <laughs> personally, because like, yeah. you get what you're interested in and it came right at the right time. And uh, you know, I, I, I bought the course, watched the course, and immediately, I and I already had some tools. Like I had uh, some dry brushes that I use in like when I'm in the infrared sauna and, some, and uh, sometimes in my routines, I'll stand in front of a red light and I'll like do some dry brush and try to multitask, do some dry brushing. But like I never had any structure. Like I never really knew what I was doing with these tools. And it was so powerful to have someone that was clearly experienced and had a real un, you know, context around the system as a whole to say, okay, now I could put these tools to use. And that could be said with anything, like a barbell could be a great tool, but if you don't know what you're doing with it, it could be like the worst tool that you've ever encountered. Um, so it was really empowering to, to be able to work on myself by myself with just a little bit of instruction. And it seems to be really minimal. And it's funny because in that course specifically, the tool that you recommend is a toothbrush. And I'm always amazed at how like the things that give us the most value seems to be the least expensive, like, you know, 
clean air or like water or like <laughs> movement, right. things that don't really cost like a walk outside, the things that don't cost. And like, here it is a, a one or $2 tool that seem to immediately have a pretty powerful effect on the way my body was feeling. And even the way I was moving, I noticed after a first few sessions of practicing your routine that like I was walking differently, like my legs were swinging differently. And that was very exciting for me that I'm like, I'm just scraping the surface. I've done a few, a few routines of this, like what will happen if I do a few hundred over the next few years. And I'm a big believer of, you know, practices and these things that make these little percentage changes, these little changes in our course that over time really create a different organism and, you know, put us in a completely different place. So I want to, first of all, I want to thank you for providing this content to the world. And I'm grateful that it reached my eyes and I was wait, ready to implement it. And, um, you know, I think it speaks to the idea that we talk on this channel a bunch that people have, have, can play such a big role in their own healing. And if we choose to, you know, look for opportunities, we could really be empowered. And sometimes it just needs uh, you know, a little bit of wake up call, a little bit of coaching. And I want to thank you for providing that. Being on that subject, do you think you could give maybe a little context around this, what seems to be a really underrated, overlooked system that is the lymphatic system? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you very much. I, I'm truly grateful for the kind words and that it was uh, so helpful for you. I mean, I tried to design the program that way to make it simple. People are usually blown away about by how simple it is and how effective simple can be. And I've always tried to make things practical too, because we can be told something, but it can be so difficult or so much to it that you're like, that's nice, but I'm never going to do it because it's way too much. So you have to remove these barriers to implementing change in someone's life. And then that's where the toothbrush came from because people might be familiar with dry brushing. It's basically where you take a brush that's dry and you rub it on your skin. But I had people tell me, I'm not sure what size brush to get. How, uh, how hard should it be? And then it's, okay, well, where should I do it? There's no structure to it. And I thought to myself, well, some people, that will be enough of a barrier for them not to actually start anything. Right. <laughs> and everybody's got a toothbrush somewhere, I hope. And then uh, you could just start there. So that's really one of the reasons that I did it, because it's very novel and practical and simple. You got to remove those barriers of entry to doing something new and you even mentioned it before by taking these little tiny action steps i call them ltas uh tiptoe into the system and the lymphatic system i'll be honest with you to me i've been practicing in healthcare for about 26 years now it is without question the most powerful thing that i've ever done for an intervention or studied or taught people uh with how many changes it can make and profound changes it can make when you just show a little bit of TLC love and attention. And I didn't really come across the lymphatic work until much later in my career because like everyone else, nobody stressed to me how important it was. It's never really covered in medicine at all unless you have cancer. And the, they spend maybe 15 minutes on it in professional school if you're lucky. Because <laughs> this is amazing. Well, why, why do you need that thing? And, uh, you know, it, it's changing these days, thankfully, with some of the stuff I've been trying to put out there and also with the current research, I'm really happy to see. But um, I would never have discovered it either if I didn't get really sick myself. I had uh, about five years ago, my body just decided to go crazy turn on itself i got really sick and what people might call an autoimmune disease that's where medicine really doesn't have any idea your body just decides to oh i'm gonna start breaking you down now i got nothing better to do um and i was just awful 
uh, inflammation everywhere, brain fog, infections, pain, discomfort, you name it. I mean, the name of the autoimmune disease really doesn't matter because they're all from the same thing, which is chronic inflammation. And you'll see the immune system is the number one system to reduce inflammation in the body. And the traditional medical approaches to try and help me damn near killed me. Now, they didn't do it on purpose. It just seems to be a side effect very often of that paradigm of nothing but drugs or surgery. And when you have a weakened immune system, those things make you more vulnerable. And I was just at a point where I was about ready to give up, honestly, lost hope. I was disempowered, you might say. Um, and I just thought there has to be something more to this thing. And I had a friend actually reach out to me. You can call it maybe that universe thing, kind of like Facebook shows up on your feed, right? And he said, uh, I, I'm going to London for this workshop, and it's based in uh, energy medicine. And I've always wanted to study more about energy systems of the body in general, just from a standpoint of how cellular energy works. I mean, how do we heal? How do we regenerate? And it, it was a Wednesday, and the course was on a Saturday. And I said, you know what, I, I'll go because I, I'm looking for answers, and why not? And it was at this course when I went there that the, I was struggling, probably at one of the worst points, and it was really hard for me to get there. And the people who were there followed me on my social media, and they actually said to me, said, Doc, man, I no offense, but you look horrible. I'm like, <laughs> thanks, you know, because I'm supposed to be this thing of health and I was just spiraling. I said, I, I, I'm lost, man. And they said, I, the instructor said, well, I think I know what your problem is. And I go, really? And he goes, yeah, he, he come on over here. And he stuck two fingers right behind the angle of my jaw, at the top of my neck on either side. And that's where the largest lymph node in your neck sits and the lymph node is basically a detoxification system of your body the lymph detoxifies you gets rid of bacteria viruses parasites fungus metabolic waste any kind of bad stuff in your body you don't want that system is the big driver of getting it out it's, the it's like system it's the sewage system big dog on the block. If that thing doesn't work, if it goes kaput, you're dead in a day. I mean, you're done for. So it's kind of important why we don't talk about it blew my mind. And he stuck two fingers there and I was swollen and puffy and, and extreme pain. And I was like, what the hell? Said, you got a lymphatic system problem. I said, lymph what? Well, I never even thought about looking at that system because uh, I, I was so focused in on the nervous system and then going after the immune system. But the lymphatic system is a giant part of the immune system, huge drive for that. And I, I said, this kind of makes sense. And then he subsequently pressed on all the major lymph node regions of my body. And you've got clusters of them that gather together. And that's what I teach in the video. Some of the big areas are in your groin. They're in your uh, shoulder slash armpit behind your knee. And of course, in your abdomen is where you have a lot. Every single one of those areas was more painful than the last one. <laughs> and I kid you not, the day after that, I actually felt like 40% better just from the assessment itself. Just from him poking around on you. Yeah, because he's unclogging my sewage system, basically. Everything was stuck, and I was basically deteriorating from the inside out from too much toxicity. And sewage system is the great explanation for it. I mean, imagine how you would feel in your house if every time you went to the bathroom, you couldn't flush the toilet. It's probably going to be pretty nasty inside your house. Well, that's what your my body had to deal with, or people's body has to deal with. But it's like this. So the very act of stimulating it to get rid of things, because it was just so overwhelmed, made me feel better. And then from there, I was just like a dog with a bone. If anybody knows me, when I get onto something, I don't let go. 
And I was intrigued by that. And then I just went after any type of research that I could possibly find on the limp, which wasn't a lot. Um, and then I started to uh, tie it together with everything else I've studied in the past, trying to find answers for chronic pain on pain science and neuroscience and um, the immune system and psychology and emotions. And I was able to integrate all those things with what I discovered with the limp. And I said, this is the answer I've been looking for. This is the reason that so many things might hit a roadblock that uh, stopped working or didn't really work that well because nobody was taking care of the limp. And then when you get into looking at limp, many, when you get into it, they overcomplicate it. They give you these protocols or these approaches where it seems like it's so delicate and that if you don't do it the right way, you're going to explode your heart or something. And it's <laughs> not that difficult. It, it's really not. I had to take it and simplify it, but make it to where every human knew that they could do it or felt comfortable doing it. Because I said to myself, listen, if I could feel so much better doing this, everybody else should feel a difference doing it. And if I was so blown away when I found it, I know other people would want it. And I didn't even know about it. And I'm in this industry. So I know that an average person who is suffering is not going to know about it because their doctor sure as hell ain't going to tell them about it. Unless they've got cancer, that's the easy one to look at it because cancer spreads through the lymphatic system that in and of itself should tell you something right there that yeah. it can send tumor cells any place in your damn body from a spot the furthest away from where it migrates that shows you how interconnected the system is and i found that pain worked the same way where it could migrate pain to any place in the body from a lymph node that is um congested or overwhelmed and then I just came back and started to put a program together and began to try it on my clients and see what worked best, the feedback that I got, and then changing it up. And then that's when I decided to put out the video because I noticed that there was nothing else out there like it. And I always remember a quote that Gandhi said once, and most people have heard of Gandhi. He said, uh, be the change that you want to see in the world. I said, well, nobody's got anything on limp, so hell, I'll do it. So I just, I put it out there, and maybe a couple of people will like it. Well, it, that thing freaking exploded, and it, it took off like a rocket ship because people actually did it because it was easy to implement, but it works. And they notice some very fast changes, and they get excited. They become empowered. They get hopeful. And they're, wow, I just do like a couple of minutes. Imagine how I'd feel if I did it more often. And then it just is a springboard from there. What I know I went through like a lot. Common, but... <laughs> what were some of the common changes that your patients would like report back when they started practicing? Well, pain is a big one. They'd start to notice that pain changes, particularly chronic pain that they've had for a long period of time. Uh, that was number one. Then you'd also get a changes in some of the objective things that we would look at in regards to range of motion. They would be able to move further than they did before. A lot of them actually noticed that they were less tired, less fatigued. They'd have more energy. The biggest thing that changed for me was I had a significant decrease in my brain fog. My, my brain had such inflammation in there that I was losing the ability to process information, put information together, and actually have any kind of coherent output. I was on a fast track to a neurodegenerative uh, disorder in the brain. So, uh, signs of Alzheimer's I was getting where I, would, I couldn't remember things that I just said I was unaware of my environment a lot. I was taking four to five naps a day and then never feeling rested. And I had a pretty significant change in that relatively fast. And then I noticed that a lot of my other clients were doing that as well because the brain, when it gets a lot of inflammation in it, then it starts to uh, 
begin to really affect your nervous system overall. And then one of the first signs of chronic inflammation and systemic inflammation in the body is brain fog or memory loss and fatigue. So I, I would reading notice that. that. I, I guess uh, several years ago, they they discovered that the brain has its own, I guess, lymphatic system. I think they call it the glymphatic system. Yes. That's actually that it was like drained uh, into the like the body's like primary lymphatic system? Yes, it does. It has a couple different mechanisms, but it does. And then what many people don't know is it was actually discovered over 200 years ago. Oh, wow. Uh, some, somebody found it, but just like anything else, if it goes outside the paradigm of the day, then you're ridiculed, then you're ousted, and then they shove it under the rug, and then you never hear about it again until later on. Somebody says, well, oopsie-daisy. Guess what? It actually was there all along. And then now they say like 10 years uh, ago, they found it. But it's always been there. We just didn't see the damn thing. Does that make sense? Right. Um, yeah. So it, it's, it's got two parts, of the, a couple of parts of the, the, how the brain drains. It uh, will go into the, the deep lymph nodes in the neck that run right along the side of your throat. So they drain from the brain down along the side of the neck, and then they go from the side of the throat down into the top of the collarbone into your venous system, and then that will take it back to your heart. So the parts from the brain will drain into your primary lymph, and then you have other ones that will drain through your sinuses in the front right here. And then that drains through the front of your skull here up above your eyes and what they call the cribriform plate that'll drain through there, and which is the, has the fluid that coats your brain called the cerebrospinal fluid. Some people may have heard I, of that. I was amazed at the course at some of the, the visuals that you have and you, you know, when you, I guess you had some computer generated images that, sh that like maps out the lymphatic system. And one, the sheer right. like spread that it has through the body is kind of mind boggling that this never gets talked about when clearly it's integrated with like everything else through the entire body and all these nodes along the way and the sheer number of them and the, um, and you reference the amount of fluid. And I guess we don't, you know, we're filled with this fluid, but we don't think of it because like, if you slice your arm, you don't see lymph just like pour out on the ground. Like right. the way it's stored, and I don't really understand, I'm not a doctor, I don't understand the science behind where this is all stored, but the, sh the volume of the liquid is kind of mind boggling and the, the reach throughout the body. And there was, I think there was a, an image that you showed all the lymph nodes or clusters of them and how this large percentage of them were in the neck. And there's so many, it's almost like, how is there room for, any other material there's so much of it and like how could we have so much of something in our body and it goes so untalked about unnoticed like how did it ever get swept under the rug so much in like the i don't know the western medical model well they kind of did that with a lot of different things in the past they did that with fascia you know, fascia is the biggest buzzword of the day still, and it's tied to everything, fascia this, fascia that. But it wasn't too long ago that nobody even paid any attention at all to it. It would just cut right through it, surgeons, let me get through that white stuff so I can get to the important things underneath. And then we realized that, wow, that's a pretty important uh, organ to the body to give it a sense of where it is and uh, how it moves and is connected to everything. And we just bypassed it. And we did the same thing with the lymph. And uh, it's glad to see that it's finally coming around. I think in part it might be because we finally maybe have some technology that can give them a peek inside of stuff that was always there. They just couldn't visually see it but just because you can't see it doesn't mean it hasn't been there all along right, right. and 
when, uh, so a lot of that is changed when they were able to come up with what they call functional MRIs, being able to see the brain in real time, things like that. And um, just changing that, the scope of how they uh, look at the body from there. Uh, but yeah, it's quite frustrating sometimes, honestly, of how anybody, when, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And <laughs> it, anytime somebody, I show it to them, they, they're used to you like, this, this is amazingly powerful. I, I'm really astounded that nobody ever mentioned this system to me. And it still gets discounted all the time when I speak to people and chronic pain because they say, oh, I mentioned lumbatics, and I said, oh, I won't have anything to do with what you got because like I said before, the only time that'll come into play is if you have cancer or lymphoma or anything like that. Otherwise they won't give it easy or lymphedema where you've got body parts that are swollen and they won't get unswollen. And some, even then they'll probably just look at your heart, but you have to realize that the cardiovascular system, the vascular system works directly with the lymphatic system. One works, you got a problem with one, you got a problem with the other. And of course, when you've got lymphedema in something that's like swollen, it usually will happen in your legs a lot. That's why people wear compression socks or they get it when they fly on a plane and They'll put compression socks on. I'm like, okay, well, where in the hell do you think all that lymph's got to go? It's got to go up behind your knee, up your leg, into your groin, into your pelvis, into your abdomen, up your spine, all the way to the top of your neck and back to your heart. If it's blocked in any one of those primary nodes, and trust me, it will be, uh, it's going to stay in your damn leg. <laughs> I don't care how many compression socks you put in there. So what I try to tell people is the same thing with pain. I'm going to put the compression sock on you, but I'm going to clear all those big lymph channels all the way up to your neck so that that fluid, that swelling can get out. And it's really important that people understand this. Let's say you have an injury, you get swelling and inflammation, right? And you're supposed to get swelling and inflammation because it comes on in to try to protect the region and surround it and deliver some protection, oxygen, and nutrients and stuff like that. But you're not supposed to keep it. It's supposed to eventually go away. And the number one system that reduces swelling is lymphatics. When you have, say you twist your ankle and it gets all swollen, it's supposed to go that way, but that swelling has to get out. And you put ice on it and you think ice got the swelling out of it. Well, I got news for you. The ice didn't do that. The lymphatics did that. They pull it up and out. And it'll usually keep coming back if you don't have a cleared pathway, a cleared channel for it to do that. And then you also have inflammation in your body that happens every time just from everyday life and stress. And we break billions and billions of cells down every day. And then we rebuild new ones. That's called regeneration. That's life. Right? We get old ones and then you have to get rid of the old ones. So you've got room for the new ones. Well, all those old ones, that's waste. That's, metabolic waste if that can't get out that stays inside and when it stays inside you become toxic and you become inflamed and you have so much toxicity inside of you that you can't absorb any of the good nutrients that you're trying to put in to stay healthy so then you hit this roadblock a central tenet of my work is this you always have to detoxify the body first, which means take out the toxins that are already in there. And you have to reduce the toxic load going in as well, which is usually tied to your environment. Right. And uh, then you can start adding in the good stuff because mo most people are already trying to add in good stuff right? Through supplements, through nutrition, through food, even through therapy, therapy, but they've got it backwards. You can't absorb all those things until you reduce toxicity first. If you reduce toxicity first, your body will automatically allow you to absorb more of the good stuff. 
that's a huge concept for people to understand is that many times their therapies that they're trying to use to help themselves will work, but they're not going to work as efficiently as because you just did step two before you did step one. Yeah. And I you feel like, ch- change like the I, order. I know in my healing journey, detox has become more of like a way of life than an event. And it really bugs me that people don't believe in the word detox. I'm like, well, I don't care what the hell you call it. It still happens. I mean, there's a reason that your body has all of these organs. Most of your organs, if not every damn one of them, are designed to eliminate toxins from your body. What do you think pee and poop is? Why do you do that? Because your body's bored during the day? It's got nothing better to do? No, it's trying to get rid of stuff that goes in, got to get out. You sweat, same way. Every time you breathe out through your mouth and your nose, you exhale toxins. Your liver gets rid of toxins, right? Your fat gets, it takes on toxins. And your lymph is a big one. But it's the, it's the most important one. And nobody pays attention to it. So for those people that don't believe in detoxification, I'm like, well, you need to go back and read because that's what the body does, right? So uh, that's what the body does. I'd like to touch a little bit on one of the things that I experienced when I started practicing. So I've been practicing movement for a while, and I guess being an observer, a teacher of movement, and a regular practitioner myself, you get pretty in tune over the years, like maybe even to a fault, like hyper in tune with Mm -hmm. how you move. And you, you start to sense all these little all the little nuance internally in your body when you move and you, you want to block it out and you want to let your environment kind of dictate your movement. But, you know, it's hard to get out of your own head sometimes. And Mm -hmm. along that way, like you notice how one side feels different and you, you notice your tendencies. Like if I turn to the right, it feels like this. I've turned to the left feels like this. I know they're not the same. And there's some natural asymmetries. I mean, our body's not symmetrical. Some organs we have one, some we have two. They're not necessarily centered. So there's, there's probably not a single person that, you know, doesn't have some asymmetry from one side to the other. Hmm. But one thing I noticed, like, when I turn one direction, I always chalked it up to like, the tissue relationships, like, from a muscular standpoint, like, you know, that might be interpreted by somebody as this muscle's tight on this side relative to this side. And, right. you know, I just assumed that was tight. And for whatever reason, for, um, but what I noticed after like just a couple sessions of, you know, doing these lymphatic self-treatments, like that was starting to free up. And I'm like, man, this whole time, mm-hmm. I'm just, I'm assuming I have this, you know, muscular imbalance from side to side and I'm creating change here, applying almost zero pressure. Like I can't even really, it's hard to quantify. Like (laughs) you dropped a a quarter or a nickel on your hand and felt like how much pressure that felt like we're talking very low amounts of pressure on the body with a $2 tool a toothbrush or even my fingers and just in a certain pattern and within you know a couple sessions like wow i'm literally moving differently and that was really interesting that um, that there's this relationship where if there's some kind of obstruction or some kind of lack of uh, optimal flow in this system that it's going to affect you know our skeletal muscular system Um, and that poses a question so you mentioned cancer a little bit earlier. Are there circumstances because when we treat ourselves or if we're getting, you know, a practitioner when we're, we're able to like, you know, go out in the world and see a practitioner again, like, and we're getting worked on. It, if that's moving lymph through our body, which is a desired result, is there a risk involved if we, if we do have a cancer situation going on or we do have an infection are we at risk at spreading that through the body through that system 
That's a great question. Well, in regards to active infections, when you're currently going under an active infection, for instance, and you have a high fever, you pretty much just let the body do what it's designed to do and, you know, let it do its thing. So one of the contraindications to lymph work is if somebody's during an active infection at the moment and they have a high fever, you don't do that. But the cancer one is very interesting because um, in outside of the United States, cancer tre uh, lymphatic treatments for cancer is one of the top things that they do to try to purge the body from. Because the idea behind lymphatics is, yeah, it can send it places too, but it also kills things. That's its job, is to kill viruses, parasites, toxins, cancer, fungus, things like that. And that's just and, because it's transporting immune cells, I guess? Yeah, it's a huge part of your immune system for your lymphocytes and your macrophages. And you have so many things going at an immune system level inside every lymph node, you can't even fathom it. If you put it on a whiteboard and drew it out, it'd explode your head. And as you got, you know, hundreds and hundreds of lymph nodes, and you got billions of endpoint capillaries that do that. So their job is to eliminate that stuff. And then when you look at how the lymphatic system sets the tone for your cellular environment, there's a lot of people that are saying that, well, the environment is what triggers your uh, cancer to come get you. Because cancer cells are always inside you. They don't just jump you out of nowhere. They're always there. Your immune system keeps them at bay. But eventually what happens is the immune can't, this system can't keep them at bay anymore and then they over mutate and then they begin to attack you and they can't keep up. Well, the environment, the lymphatic system sets the environment of the, for the body and what the cells can do. And it's actually a huge part of treatment that they do for cancer. Uh, but in the United States, it, uh, it, from the only some research that I've seen is it's no longer a contraindication to get lymphatic work with cancer when it used to be. Oh, really? um, I, yeah, it's no longer listed as a contraindication. But I usually uh, caution people to always check if, if they're actively going through cancer now and they're going through chemotherapy of any type or radiation of any type or have an active tumor to always consult their oncologist before they do any type of lymphatic work because some, some will say it's okay, some will say probably no. It really just depends on sometimes their approach to things and where they are on their current research and then where you might be on your current stage of something. There's so many different variables in there. But you can do it if you've, if you've had cancer, you can absolutely do it no matter what. If you've, for instance, been cleared and okay, I had, for me, I had thyroid cancer 15 years ago and I can do it now, no problem, right? So once you got a clean bill. But according to the research that I've seen, you can also do it when you have cancer, but you always want to check with your oncologist first. So even though people get the program from me, I say, I want you to check with your physician, like you would do anything. You don't want to start an exercise program, okay. right? So you start with your physician to begin to do that before they get into it. So, um, that's the current state as it is now, and I think it's forever changing based on the current research. I think the more that we learn about the lymphatic system and the huge role that it plays, uh, it's going to be more of a big part in um, uh, recovery and regeneration from a lot of different things. That's why I call my, my program the Body Aquarium, because it's an analogy to the water in your fish tank is what determines the quality of the water in your fish tank determines the quality of everything in the fish tank, even whether the fish are going to live or die. And it's the same thing with the quality of the liquid and water inside of your body. You're mostly water. And the lymphatic system, it's the big filter for your tank. And if you have a poor filter in your fish tank, most of you know what your fish tank will look like. Um, and it's the same thing with the human body on the inside you have a poor filtration system then you're probably just like that toxic fish tank as well i want to try to help you clean your tank so that things can begin to thrive like they have the potential to do inside the tank 
So I'm just speaking from myself from a personal standpoint is that I had cancer 15 years ago. And from what I know about my lymphatic system, it was a horrific mess all the way back then, which is one of the reasons I think why I ended up getting that cancer at such a young age. And then they took out the tumor, which was my thyroid gland, and they took out one third of the lymph nodes in my neck. And as you know, um, you have a huge amount of lymph nodes in your neck. And they're supposed to help drain your brain as well. So it, it took the it took the cancer out, you know, it took lymph nodes out. I went through radiation, all good, no harm, no foul. Um, but 15 years later, my body manifested with, you know, an autoimmune disease. And then I just got it somewhere else. And then I got to the brain fog because my brain wasn't able to efficiently drain lymph for 15 more years after my cancer when it was already backed up because of what they did. Um, oh, so that's, that's my own, that's my own timeline of putting stuff together of understanding. Well, how are you doing now? You look system. great, man. I mean, dude, let me tell you this much, man. Like I'm 53 years old. Oh, I wow. move better and feel better than I did when I was 23. And I had, when I was sick with my inflammation, I had to close my practice and I had to stop teaching for a year because I just couldn't think. And I gained a lot of weight because I was puffy and swollen and toxic. And when I came across the limp and I started to work with the limp and my, uh, getting my inflammation under control, got my brain back. It was like sharper than ever, but I also lost 30 pounds of inflammation in one month. And that includes fluid accumulation, waste accumulation, and um, body fat, because you'll, you'll discover, especially when you get more into my program, that your body uses fat cells to surround excess toxicity and toxicity, toxins. So it protects you from toxins by making you fat. I'm just trying yeah, to pull think, the toxins you know, they, they away. Say that, and correct me if I'm wrong, that we store a lot of toxins, whether they're environmental toxins in our fat cells as a protective mechanism to like keep them out of the bloodstream too, because to yeah, like limit our exposure, we like hide them in our fat cells. Yeah. Well, fat cells are also an organ. They're a detox organ. And your, your body says, okay, well, listen, uh, dude, it, it, it's really important that we protect these organ things because without the organs, you're going to die quick, fast, and hurry. So let's try this. I'm just going to make you really fat. I'm going to take all this stuff away as best I can, put it in these fat cells, and I'm going to make you bigger. You might not like yourself very much the what you see in the mirror, but guess what? I don't care if you're happy. I just care that you're not dead. That's the right. way your brain thinks. Your brain doesn't care whether you like yourself. It doesn't care whether you're happy or not. It just says, dude, if you're taking another breath, that's a good thing. That's all it cares about. And when you approach pain and when you, you approach what the body systems do, do and why the brain, the brain always does things for one reason and one reason only. Don't die right now. I right. don't care what you have to do or whether it makes sense to you why I'm doing it. I just don't want to be dead because that's no fun. And once you come from that aspect of a priority system, you, you have what they call a first brain and a second brain. And the first brain is that primal brain, the back of your head that kicks in to fight, fight, freeze, freak out, survive, do whatever it takes. It's also the emotional brain. That's the one that, takes and runs the show and then that front brain comes in later to try to overrule the second one once you're alive so this guy makes all the decisions but one of the reasons that i concentrated on the lymphatic system so much is this if we know that survival is top priority for the brain and I know that if my lymphatic system stops working, like if it just completely stopped working, I would be dead really fast, like awful fast. So your brain puts that 
pretty high up on a level of importance that it should be functioning well for me to survive. And if we neglect it, then you're going to pay the price for it and all of the other systems of the body. That's why if you can help the lymphatic system, all the other systems of your body notice a change or notice an improvement. And that's why somebody says, Don, is it crazy? But you have me rub my lymph stuff here and I've had this problem in my lower back for 15 freaking years and everybody's been going after my back and it feels so much better from what you just did. No, it's not crazy at all. It is in medicine because they'll tell you the lymph's got nothing to do with your back. And I'm like, holy cow, I can't. What? It's got everything to do with your back because it's all in the fish tank, right? And usually going after your back for 15 years, if that's not working, maybe that's telling you it's not a back problem. And then once I lay it out for them and I show them the logistics of how all these systems work together and how the lymph is, not to mention that when I assess the lymph on everybody, it's usually horrifically painful in those regions. And most people say, I had no idea that all those areas hurt so much. And then I had no, nobody ever checked those ever in my life. And then with regards to movement, right? I mean, if you free up that tissue and that fluid, you're going to move so much easier because you have less restrictions and less toxicity. And then if you tie it back, the, the more you move, the more toxins that you make right? Because when I move, I use a lot more what? Muscle. And I use a lot more blood flow and I use a lot more nutrients. Well, if uh, the more muscle I use, the more metabolic waste I create. What if I have a body that can't get rid of metabolic waste to begin with? And then I'm going to move on top of it. Usually you feel worse. Or your body will restrict you from moving because it knows that, dude, the more you move, the more toxic you're going to make me. I can't, I can't have you move more. And then it says, what is a really great strategy for me to prevent Dr. Perry from moving more? Oh, I have a novel idea. I'm going to tighten the hell out of every muscle he's got. So then he's so tight he can't move. And then they go problem solved. Hmm. But then we go in and we start to massage the tightness and stretch the tightness and foam roll the tightness. And we force ourselves to move usually too much, too fast, too hard, too soon. We go from zero to 100 miles an hour. And then the body re tightens it up and we keep doing this dance and this dance. And then it says to itself, well, hell, tightening up the tissues didn't work so much. So how about I go another level? I'm going to tighten up and lock all these joints down so you can't move in your hip you can't move in your ankle you can't move in your back and you lose range of motion you get tight you get stiff and you degenerate and you decay and we call that arthritis and then we go in there and we try to move those and that's a good thing that's awesome but usually you'll find out why in the hell does my hip always keep locking up even though i release it it comes back and gets tight again because you haven't taken care of the underlying environment that's there. Then the body says to itself, okay, I've tried the strategy of tightness up everything. I've tried the strategy of locking down his joints. I know what I can do next to really, really get him to stop moving. I'm going to send this guy, Dr. Perry, a ton of pain. Here comes pain, because when you get pain, hopefully you're going to say, not maybe it'll go away. You'll say, dude, I better stop doing what I'm doing. So pain is a request for change, a change in your habits, a change in your behavior. So for me, in my mindset, now pain is a request of your body tapping you on the shoulder saying, hey, probably be a good idea to do lymphatic mojo body aquarium today. Do that. Do that. Here's the takeaway, man. Do that first, then move. 
then move the joints. That's what I'm telling you. You have to detox first, then supply. So that's the key. I'm not saying that all those other things don't work or we don't need them or not helpful. Do they all? Everything works. What I call the lymphatic system, I call that a amplifier, a force amplifier. That means that if you begin to do lymph, you'll find that it helps all those other things you've already been doing work better. So you said a word in there that uh, I'm partial to uh, habits. So do you, Yeah. I mean, you're 53, you're doing well, you've been on, man, such a journey. I, I appreciate you sharing some of your history there in regards to health. I hope that people could connect with just the idea that, man, you could come back from a lot of nasty stuff. The body's an amazing you can. Uh, organism and it could heal from some it could it could heal way better than people give it credit i think and i guess you're just another great example of that are there any what are like some of the habits that that you rely on like what are some of your go to strategies personally that are like your medicine that help you live you mean in relationship to limp or just kind of in general i guess limp general well being um yeah, nope. sure. Well, I give. I mean, we can tie it into the limp, and we can tie it into um, some things for the for the mind. Two things move the lymphatics primarily. One is movement. So I tell people, I, I want to say, well, how should I move? Well, yes is the answer, but <laughs> you always you always do your limp work first. So that's why I created. Uh, literally a 30 second length reset. I mean, you just slap six areas five times and your fundamental length reset is done. I mean, it's so simple. It's not even funny. You do that and then you move. And then I tell people to do what I coined 4M motion. And it means move more of yourself, more often, more ways and more environments. Which, which means basically move more of yourself just speaks for itself, right? Just right. do more of your body when you move. More often. More than you do now. Right? And I, usually by that, I, I, I tell people, it's not necessarily in one session. I just want you to move more of your body throughout the day. Right? More ways. How about you do different stuff than what you normally do? If you do yoga every day, I want you to do Tai Chi and mix Tai Chi in there or mix in strength training, right? Or climb a damn tree or something. Just throw something else in there. And, more, and then and more environment. That means how about you do all that stuff somewhere else than what you normally do? Go into a different room. Put different music on. Wear different clothes. Don't wear shoes, right? Uh, Make your music softer. Make your music louder. Go outside, do stuff like time, and then move. Then put it on the other eye. You're gonna change how you move big freaking time when you when you do that with your body. And plus, you're gonna pay more attention to how you move because you lost an eye. So you're gonna get more mindful movement when you put a patch on. Little trick there for you, by the way. Um, you just do that. And then the other one is breathing. Breathing. So when you breathe uh, through your diaphragm, and many people don't know how to do that, it's a very easy way. Just breathe in and out through your nose as much as you can when you exercise or all day long. If you breathe in through your nose and not your mouth, you will always drive more motion in your diaphragm. When you breathe through the diaphragm, you pump pressure inside of your body and you move a hell of a lot of lift huge amount of lymph when you breathe in and out through your nose those so that's two an things important concept. Very, so the lymph itself huge. you understand doesn't have its own pump so we're, we're like we are the pump like our uh, breath well, or our body or the actual movement of our of our skeleton and, and our muscular it, cells in the system is what actually is essentially creating the pump 
Yeah, so, well, not the pump in the traditional pump that we think of, of one big central pump like the heart, right? So muscular contractions will move the lymph, but you also have these smooth muscle walls along lymph, and they do call them micro hearts. They do have a little bit of movement on their own. Okay. It's not enough to facilitate it, but that's why you want to do the breathing and the muscular movement because those are the big powerhouses. So it's a yes and a no in relationship to the pump that you have. But fluids, I, I use, I, when I teach, I use the term what I call hydrodynamics, a word from physics. Uh, it means uh, how fluids move based on pressure. Right? And that's what you are. You are a pressurized cylinder inside. That's what breathing does, breathing in and out changes pressure usually what they call intra-abdominal in the belly but there's pressure in other areas from your head to your thoracic to your pelvic floor these these cat they call them body cavities and when you think about uh, a dam if you've blocked a lot of water behind the dam you have really high pressure behind the dam if I open up the dam door, right, the high pressure automatically flows towards what? Lower pressure. So that's the way fluid behaves. In your body, it's the same way. High pressure always flows towards low pressure. When you breathe in and out through your diaphragm, yes, you're driving oxygen. But more importantly, what people don't realize they're driving is all of the fluid flow in your body. I'm not talking about the blood flow through the heart. That's going to be that pump mechanism to get your vascular system, your arterial system. But you'll be moving the fluid flow in your lymphatic system. And you will actually be starting to move fluid flow in your um, blue blood vascular system that's your venous system the venous system so you actually will tap into the cardiovascular system as well because the breathing in and out moves that lymphatic pump to create high pressure to low pressure high pressure to low pressure this way so you'll actually get much better fluid dynamics of the lymph when you breathe through your diaphragm as opposed to not you'll be more stagnant, for instance. So it'll As move. if there weren't enough reasons already to get better at breathing. So to me, I'm going to be honest with you. To me, the primary reason you breathe through your diaphragm is to move your lymph and move your organs. Hmm. Right. And, and then core stability uh, is just a nice byproduct of breathing through your diaphragm. And it just so happens to be a very effective way to uh, meditate because they have you breathe through your diaphragm and through your belly and usually through your nose because you're going to move your diaphragm more when you breathe in and out through your nose. You're going to drive more nitric oxide into your body, which vasodilates the blood vessel, so it'll get more oxygen into anything. But when you breathe through your diaphragm, your organs move a lot because they drop up and down based on the pressure from the diaphragm. And I'll give you one guess where most of your lymph is located, in your gut and in your abdomen. And then you also have this nerve in your belly called your vagus nerve that communicates up to your brain. That's the nerve people know of as the stress nerve. And when you stimulate that nerve, you put yourself into a relaxed state so you can heal. That's why when you meditate, and you belly breathe, and you do that, it helps so much. Because it's the fastest way to tap into your brain through the vagus nerve. Yeah, we've and talked about that on the channel huge. before. Just that kind of upward information signal coming from the body to the vein through that. I feel like we could take a, a deep dive in the future on that nerve itself. I think that's... Um, oh, yeah. Huge that nerve right there. If you don't have that nerve stimulated to a good extent, you're you're gonna really struggle to uh, heal. 
Right? Big time. But it, that's one of those things where we have this opportunity to interact with our own healing, where it's it's really, you know, it's like right at our fingertips where we have tools that we could stimulate that nerve. And that's a, a rabbit hole that maybe we'll save for another conversation because I think we could probably spend an hour on that and I want to respect your time. Oh, at least, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, that is definitely a fascination of mine. And for the listeners out there, stay tuned. We will take deeper dives on the vagus nerve and you can learn more about uh, the power that we that really we have over how that behaves. Yeah. But um, this has been really tremendous. And I, I want to um, I want to thank you for taking this time and kind of spreading this what I consider just a really important message that I think is so overlooked. We're all walking around with like this big system in our body that we just seem to be it's not complacent, just like you don't know what you don't know. And it's like every, right. such a high percentage of people I think they just don't know about it. And it's such a it's such an interesting find. Um and you know, I think it's probably just limitless where like the potential that people could have in their journey by taking a closer look at the system and and finding ways to apply like practices to their lifestyle that support that system. And that's where I think the Stop Chasing Pain resource is so powerful. Like, you know, first of all, your course is, I got to say, it was really reasonably priced. So I, I thank you for that. It's not something that is out of reach for the average person. It's very reasonable to get this, you know, like tutorial at your fingertips. And then you have this tool that you have for the rest of your life. Uh, you know, it never goes away. You're never going to wake up and not have this system and no longer need to support it. So you'll be able to, you know, work on this forever. And I think that is really powerful. And I'm really excited personally about like where it takes me. And, you know, I'm just, you know, I came a little background on me, like I was a 240 pound, really unhealthy guy at one point and really changed my course. And it was just, it was never like a big thing that had a big impact. It was just like little things consistently mm -hmm. practiced over time. And I feel yeah. like this is one of those things, like you mentioned you know, a 30 second reset, like this little thing that we can work in our day and maybe even layer on top of something that we're already doing. Like if you're already spending, uh, let's say you're gonna go to the gym and spend an hour, like taking the first few minutes of that and working on this system, does, you know, you're not changing your schedule. I mean, you're changing the way that you spend your time, but it's a very subtle change that over time could have, I think, really powerful impacts. And I really think there's just not a lot of information out there. And you are providing this resource that, uh, you know, is very easy for people to access. It's, it's what I would cons consider, you know, one of the low hanging fruits and it's very reasonably priced. And I really encourage people to just check it out and explore your site. And I, I guess I want to ask you, if there's anything else that you would like to add to encourage people or any ideas that, about how somebody should, you know, approach this or, um, you know, any, any other thoughts on the, on the topic? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the kind words. I, I really appreciate that. And yeah. I mean, I've, I've tried to make it definitely something that anybody can get into and to have a fundamental basics program that I wanted. And I always say how well you want to master the basics and the fundamentals influences how well you do everything else after that. And I usually find that people that are struggling in life have skipped over a fundamental somewhere and the limp is pretty big. So I, that's why I put that video together. Honestly, I, I think that's probably the best place for people to start if they begin with a lymphatic mojo body aquarium video that you can stream once you own it, you own it for life and you can watch it whenever you want via Vimeo. And it, well, it's about two hours long and it walks through the whole system and explains it to you and shows you how to assess it and how to treat it on yourself. I think that's really important that people need to understand you can do it to yourself. And you can now also if somebody do it to wanted to come and, and work with a practitioner, I mean, are you in the current environment 
with uh, you know the the pandemic and the the lockdowns going on, are you still seeing patients one on one, or do you have a? I can't here because they they I'm still on lockdown here in New Jersey, and my offices are in fitness centers, and they were one of the first ones to close. Right. So I don't know when they're going to be open, but I do virtual consults for people, which means that I can show them what to do from afar. Oh, because uh, there's different levels to the left. You have that basic package that helps mostly what what I call the superficial lymph, the the stuff closest to the skin and the one that is easiest to tap into for people. But then you have the deeper lymph, and that sits further into the body around the organs and close to the spine. That can still be worked on by someone by themselves or for uh, someone can do it to them it just takes a, you have to know a little bit more at that standpoint and oh, i want to get on your schedule man i would like to uh yeah I would like there's to a way that yeah. a little deeper so that can be done virtually you can coach someone on yeah so I, I have people assess the things uh, and show them and that's actually where i show you how to clear clear every single deep lymph channel even the lymph in the brain Oh, wow. Cool. So, so yeah, and people could find you at next tier. <laughs> so people could find you at stop. Chasing at stop pain. Chasing pain. Any other, uh, yeah. any other ways for people to reach you that you want to share? That's probably the easiest. That's okay. the central hub for everything. The social I'm on every social media site, but the one I spend the most time on probably on an unhealthy amount is Instagram. <laughs> Okay. I'm on there that you can reach me through there. And I post a lot of content on there. And then the mem- the uh, website also has information about the consults. You can purchase the video from there. And I also have um, membership sites if people want to go much more in detail on different things to learn from me or wherever. This, you can find a couple of things that will keep you busy there. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, again, I want to appreciate you taking the time and I want to encourage our listeners to, you know, uh, explore a little bit and see what there is for them to discover really about themselves through learning more about these systems and through the work that you put out. So again, I appreciate it. I'm really grateful for the impact you've had on my life. And uh, I want to thank the listeners for tuning in today. I want to thank our audience for just keeping an open mind and, you know, seeing that there's a lot of ways to look at things and there's a lot of opportunities for us to learn from each other. And I hope that you got some value out of today's discussion and, you know, stay tuned. We'll have more content coming out with uh, other great voices out there that we could all learn and share from. And if you have an experience personally that you feel is relevant to this discussion, then please share it with the community and we'd love to hear it. So I appreciate your listening. I hope everybody out there, as a great day. Well, I hope you enjoyed that show today with Dr. Perry. Uh, Some really useful tips in there and some exciting information. Hopefully you learned something new. I do encourage you to check out his work. I think it's just a really uh, great way to access a tool that you can do yourself a favor and support this very important system that we that we all have that we walk around with and it, you know as i said before it's just really overlooked it seems and really underrated and if you do play around with that and you do get some benefits please reach out to the community and let us know how it's helped you and maybe uh, inspire someone else to do the same so again i hope you enjoyed and please if you have a chance take the time and leave a little feedback for me and go put a review in there, hopefully positive review, and stay tuned for more episodes. Enjoy your day.